They are all around us. Invisible and unsuspected. Three million members of a secretive society older than the American Republic. For nearly 300 years, generations of Freemasons have obeyed their oaths, hidden their rituals, and maintained their silence until now. Who are these men and these very few women? What bizarre ceremonies do they perform within their magnificent temples? What is the meaning of their costumes, their symbols, and their make-believe murders? What is the secret? See, that's what they don't want to talk about. There's nothing wrong with secrets. I think it adds a facet of fascination to it. In almost every mysterious and controversial event, from Jack the Ripper to the assassination of John F. Kennedy, you can, if you look hard enough, find Masonic involvement. We know who killed JFK. We know what happened at Area 51. Don't ask. Those conspiracy theories have been out there for a long time. Uh, I think part of it is the fact that we've never been out front and open about what we're doing. Now, for the first time on television, we penetrate the marble walls of the Masonic Lodge, witness secret rituals never before revealed to outsiders, speak the unutterable password of the third degree, and enter this long hidden realm of brotherhood and mystery, fellowship and death, as we explore and expose the secret world of the Freemasons. From the secret oaths of 14 American presidents, to the British royal family, to the Emperor Napoleon, Masons have risen to positions of tremendous wealth, fame, and authority around the world. Is this coincidence, or part of a conspiracy that stretches from our time back to myth and legend, to kings and crusaders, bloodthirsty pirates, and hidden treasure, and perhaps the great monument makers of ancient Egypt and the search for the Holy Grail. But the mysteries of the Masonic Brotherhood touch our own age as well. In fact, we travel the secret pathways of Masonic signs and symbols every day without even knowing it. The fabric of Freemasonry is deeply woven into our history our daily lives, and, it is said, some of our most horrifying crimes. Every one of our major cities contains a monument to Masonic secrecy. Ornate temples closed to outsiders and open to suspicion. Fantastic structures funded and furnished by members, dues, and donations. This is Great Queen Street in London, perhaps the most elaborate of all Masonic halls. But there are rivals for the crown. New York City. Philadelphia. Washington, D.C., American headquarters of the branch of masonry that calls itself the Scottish Rite. Within this hauntingly beautiful temple sits a mysterious marble throne engraved with just two words. Know thyself. Midnight on what could be the main street in your town we are within the walls of the temple to witness the climax of a strange and sacred ritual, performed only a few times a year. These men are not actors performing for our cameras. They are businessmen and lawyers, citizens and brothers. 
21st century Freemasons, acting out a scene that has been played out in exactly the same way at Masonic lodges all over the world since the early 1700s. A scene that leads to a chilling climax and a single secret word. Seemingly absurd to outsiders, but deadly serious to the men in the phony beards and what look like Santa Claus suits. Grand Master Hiram Biff, I am glad to have met you thus alone. This is an opportunity I have long sought. You the bearded man in a striped cap is a biblical stonemason named Hiram Abiff, architect of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Behold, give me the secret word of a master mason this instant, or I will take your life. I shall not. Then die. Grand Master Hiram Abiff, I demand of you the secret word of a master mason. He is being accosted by three younger men who demand a password that they believe will grant them wisdom and power. Israel, Hiram, King of Tyre, and myself. Grand Master Hiram Abiff, for the last time I demand of you the secret word of a Master Mason and I will take your life. My life you shall have, my integrity never. Then die! The old man's refusal costs him his life. Grand Master Hiram Abiff, I heard you cavilling with Jubala and Jubalo. From them you have escaped, but from me never. My name is Jubalum. What I propose, that I perform. I hold in my hand an instrument of death. If you refuse me now, you do so at your peril. I say, give me the secret word of a master mason. I will not. I demand of you the secret word of a master mason. I cannot. Grand Master Hiram Abiff, for the third time, I demand of you the secret word of a master mason. Your demands are vain. Wait until the temple is completed, and I will do my best to serve you. Then die. What we are witnessing is the most important initiation rite in Freemasonry, the legendary third degree. For modern Masons, the lesson is obvious. The secrets of the Brotherhood are meant to be taken to the grave. I propose that we plant a sprig of acacia at the head of the grave to mark the spot should future occasion require us to find it. Agreed. Agreed. And this is only one scene among many in this strange, cryptic stage play. Beyond Hiram Abiff's unutterable passwords are dozens of other symbols, costumes, objects, words and signs that lead Freemasons to deeper and deeper levels of their self-invented mysteries. It might be easy to dismiss the Masons as just a bunch of old guys playing dress up, but Masonry is no longer just for old guys. Hi, I'm James Cooper and I'm a Freemason. I am a Prince Hall Freemason. I am a Freemason. I'm a Freemason. And I am a Freemason. Hello, I'm Janet Wintermute and I'm a Freemason. The roster of the Brotherhood includes everyone from NBA stars to astronauts, from presidents to ordinary people who may have thought they would join in a social club, but who soon found themselves enchanted and entangled by ancient oaths and secret signs. <laughs> it's not like Freemasonry is old fashioned, it's that it's timeless. Masonry is sort of like the Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. There is a need for all secret organizations to be clear about their purposes and intentions. And therefore, the practice of neither confirming nor denying is damaging to Freemasonry uh, because the presumption is guilt. My name's Ian Markham, and I'm not a Freemason. I'm Jim Mars, and I am not a Mason. Although Freemasonry is uh, outwardly a, a very benign and, and philanthropic organization, there are dark sides to it. My name is Stephen Sukalis, and I'm not a Mason. 
if it were a secret society, n many of us would not know about it. I mean, they have their, in, here in the States, they have the uh, logo of the square and the compass intertwined with the letter G right on the buildings, on the face of the building. So it's not a secret society in that sense, but it is a society with the secrets. Why has Freemasonry been so often linked with unsolved crimes and hidden cabals? The answer lies in the secrecy of the order itself. Amen. Probing the origins of the Masonic Brotherhood is an exercise in forensics, fantasy, and faith. But one thing is certain, in the year 1717, in the shadows of St Paul's Cathedral in London, a group of gentlemen convene at a pub called the Goose and Gridiron and formally pledge their allegiance to the club they call the Freemasons. Real Masons, called Operative, hammer away at marble and stone, but these self-styled Masons are aristocrats with enough leisure time to indulge in secret passwords and costume dramas. They call themselves speculative masons, and they spend their evenings speculating on the meaning of life. Freemasons have a long tradition of secrecy. Uh, some of the original secrets of the Freemasons were the operative secrets. They knew how to cut stones so it would be as strong as possible if they put it across a lentil. They knew how to make arches. Very importantly, they knew how to make squares. The secrets uh, carried on, uh, certainly by the time modern Freemasonry is formed in the early 1700s, uh, uh, the trade secrets are no longer important, but it becomes a very important symbol. Once you have become a Mason, you are entitled to be inside the closed door. You're entitled to be in the inner circle. Merciful Master, there is an alarm at the door. Attend to the alarm. What happens in 1717 um, is still relatively mysterious. We've only got one broadly contemporary account of the foundation uh, of the Grand Lodge. There are no reports in uh, contemporary newspapers or anything like that. The Freemasons are one of dozens of London dining and drinking fraternities. But just six years after the meeting at the Goose and Gridiron, they already have hundreds of members, several branches called lodges, and a written constitution filled with fantastic symbols, signs, tools, hand clasps, and even their own alphabet. They devise a hierarchy of novice masons, master masons, and grand masters, 33 levels called degrees. Each one reached through a secret initiation and rewarded with a secret password that members swear never to utter outside the lodge under penalty of death. New members must be approved by secret ballot. A white ball for a yes vote. A single dark stone means exclusion. It's the origin of the term black ball. Three most important Masonic symbols have endured unchanged since the 1700s. The most familiar is the letter G. But what does it stand for? God, geometry, geography, or grand architect, the true designer of the universe. There is no single official definition. The compass reminds members to restrain their desires and encompass their deeds within a moral code. The square represents honesty and fair dealing. Dozens of cryptic gestures and complex handshakes allow Freemasons to identify each other and the degree each one has reached. Echoes of an age before business cards and blackberries. The stonemason who is traveling from one building site to another, maybe uh, between countries even, over hundreds of miles, 
who can't read and write, okay? How is he going to identify himself to someone else that he is a stonemason? Well, he's got handshake. And this sh only shows that this stonemason to another stonemason, it, that they are stonemasons. We still like to use our handshake instead of a piece of plastic or a piece of paper. And there is another fixture of every Masonic meeting laid down in the original constitution of 1723. Two stone pillars. Still the centerpiece of every Masonic meeting hall in the world. But if the columns are the invention of the gentlemen at the Goose and Gridiron, and if they held their first meeting in 1717, then how do we explain this? Our quest for the secrets of Freemasonry leads to Scotland. Just seven miles from the capital city of Edinburgh, on the rolling rural estate of one of the great Scottish clans, stands the Chapel of Roslyn. For nearly 500 years, one of the most famous and mysterious churches in the world. The supporting columns at Roslyn seem to follow the Masonic Code, but they were erected 300 years before the meeting at a London pub at which modern masonry was founded. And this fellow peering down from the architecture is a master mason, possibly the star of the Masonic morality play Hiram Abiff. Is Rosalind the true birthplace of Freemasonry? And what do the stones and symbols mean? The closer we look at Roslyn, the more cryptic it becomes. This is far more than a mere church. It is a mystifying museum of secret sculpture and bizarre symbolism, an enigma carved in Scottish stone. At the heart of the mystery are the mismatched pillars known as the Master and the Apprentice. Merely odd to an outsider, but instantly recognisable to any Freemason. According to legend, our master mason completed one column and then went away. On his return, he found that his apprentice had crafted a much more magnificent pillar. And in a jealous rage, he killed the younger man. According to legend, they are replicas of the pillars that stood at the entrance to the Temple of Solomon repository of the Ten Commandments, the holy nucleus of the biblical world. But at Rosalind, the myth divides into two. Are these columns just a symbol, or do they actually contain or point the way to some sort of priceless physical treasure? In an age of uncertainty, we seek certainty. Rosalind is not about certainty or putting something in a neat little box that everyone can say that's for sure what it is. That is not the point, I don't think. It is, it is a personal challenge for us to decode this building. I've studied this certainly 40 years. I have to say that the place is as big a mystery to me almost as it was when I first began as to why it was built. It is a total mystery. If Rosalind is the true birthplace of Freemasonry, then who built it, and why? And what do the twin columns, repeated in every Masonic hall in the modern world, really mean? And if there is a hidden treasury here, does it contain relics of gold or tokens of God? King Solomon's long-vanished temple may be the key to the mystery. A thousand years ago, it was the object of a great quest, led by European noblemen who relinquished all their possessions except for a single sword. They called themselves the Knights Templar, meaning the Knights of the Temple. It was called a new knighthood, meaning these would be warrior monks 
not merely monks who prayed all day, but not also only those who fought on the battlefield. So they began as a type of spiritual special forces for Christ, you might say. But the Knights Templar had more in mind than slaughter and salvation. Their goal was to find the site of Solomon's temple amid Jerusalem's crumbled stones. The Old Testament links the temple to Master Mason Hiram Abiff and to the Ark of the Covenant, where Solomon kept the tablets on which God inscribed the Ten Commandments. But by the time the Knights Templar arrived, there were rumors of more buried treasure, including the vessel from which Jesus drank at the Last Supper, the fabled Holy Grail. Inspired by legend and fueled by faith, the Knights reached Jerusalem. But what they found where the two pillars once stood and where they took it, no one knows. What is the treasure? Well, some authors claim it's the Holy Grail, some say it's the Ark of the Covenant, some say it's the embalmed head of Jesus Christ, some say it's the lost writings of, of Jesus Christ, some think it actually is gold and precious jewels and all that kind of stuff. And of course the other one that is the hottest is that it's in fact none of these physical things, but it in fact is the secret of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And so Rosalind Chapel has become a focus for all this uh, speculation. The columns at Scotland's most bizarre chapel have come to be known as the Pillars of Knowledge. And some Freemasons believe that it was wisdom, not gold and jewels, that the Templars were seeking in the Holy Land. The theories are endless. And the Knights Templars uh, were gaining this information under the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, which had been collected and gathered there from the ancient mystery schools of Egypt and Greece. And these were the ancient secrets that had been passed down since the beginning of time. Whatever the Templars found, kings and princes back home in Europe grew dangerously jealous. The decision was made to take the Knights down. The raid began on a Friday in October, 1307, Friday the 13th. Today, we have the folklore phrase, Friday the 13th, unlucky for some, which many believe is based on this Templar raid. If the Knights Templar were wiped out in 1307, how did their legacy survive? Are Freemasons their true successors, or just playing at it? The quest for the secrets of Freemasonry leads to Scotland in one of the most tantalizing Masonic legends of all, the legend of William Sinclair, builder of Roslyn, hereditary Grand Master Mason of Scotland, and perhaps the descendant of one of the few Knights Templar who escaped, Friday the 13th. There's only one inscription in this chapel, and you would expect the builder of the chapel, William Sinclair, who was building it in 1450, to pay attention to what he's written in it. And I would also imagine that he expected everybody that came to the chapel to realize there was only one inscription, and that inscription must be meaningful. The inscription reads in Latin, wine is strong, kings are stronger, stronger than these are women, but above all, truth is the strongest. It's a claimed heritage, it's a legendary heritage, but I can't give you any, uh, any historical evidence to support it, but it's a lovely story. <laughs> the links between the Knights Templar and the Freemasons may stand forever at the junction of history and myth. But there are clues that the Knights did not all disappear on that fateful Friday the 13th. 
in Jerusalem, the Templars had joined forces with knights from the island of Malta, warriors who later turned to piracy under a flag we all know today. The Skull and Crossbones. It's a depiction of the Templars' strange burial custom, severing the dead man's legs and arranging them in the coffin like this. It's a practice alluded to in some of the carvings and monuments at Roslyn, leading some scholars to believe that a few knights fled to Scotland, and that a century later, William Sinclair built this chapel as a means of passing down their forbidden signs and symbols. The Templars may have inspired more than one secret society. Perhaps the most infamous is Yale University's Skull and Bones Club. Since 1832, this cultish playpen for the sons of America's most powerful families has enfolded Presidents Taft, Franklin Roosevelt, George Bush, George W. Bush, and even John Kerry. The Skull and Bonesmen, who will reveal no details about the purpose or practices of their club, proudly fly the pirate banner, a symbolic link to the Knights Templar and perhaps to the mystic origins of Freemasonry as well. And Skull and Bones may in fact be one of many occult organizations inspired by the Templars. There are hints of others that are much more bizarre. Best-selling author Philip Gardner claims to have been initiated into the order with clear links to the Templars. At the end of the room was a very large curtain. Through the curtain was stuck a big head, goat's head. It was all dripping, it was quite disgusting. And they called it the head of Baphomet, the head that the Knights Templar are supposed to have worshipped. During the initiation, the master, the Grand Master, would say to you, go and kiss the backside of Baphomet which means I've got to go through the curtain, do as I'm told, go through this curtain and kiss the backside of this disgusting looking goat. So I did, being somebody who doesn't really care. And when you get through there, it's actually a naked woman with her buttocks. So the backside of Baphomet is a reward if you do as you're told. Gardiner says that this bizarre ritual was not his elevation to a higher Masonic degree. There's no reason not to believe him, but the truth is, non-Masons will never really know. There are dozens of costume dramas in the Freemasons' repertoire. Ceremonies that initiates are forbidden to describe. Your pardon will depend upon your future conduct. Freemasonry is the latest incarnation of what is known as the underground stream. This is a hidden stream of knowledge that has been passed down since uh, the dawn of human history. That this lodge at this time may humbly reflect that order and beauty which reigns forever before thy throne. Amen. So the question arises again. If Freemasonry is not a religion, and not merely a man's theatrical club, then what is it? I have been asked many times for a definition. Um, one that we hear quite often is that uh, we attempt to make um, good men better, we can't make bad men good. The other one, the one that I prefer, is a peculiar system of morality, and peculiar of course here means unusual or special. So in a peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, of which we have lots and lots and lots. Hi, I'm James Cooper and I'm a Freemason. My name is Harold Granger and yes, I am a Freemason. November of 2005 actually, that's when I joined Masonry in the Scottish Rite. I came into the United States in 1958. I found a person who was a Mason and I told him I want to be a Mason. It, it's one of those things that it takes a lifetime to understand. You know, you can, you can show someone something, you know, the, the, the pictures or the rituals, and you, you can show someone something, but to truly grasp the depth that's there takes years of study. A Freemason is different. 
If everybody knew what Freemasonry was without joining, what would be the point in joining? The Chronicles of Freemasonry focus on its legendary beginnings. If you go back to the earliest Masonic document in Scotland, the Kirkwall Scroll, which carbon dates to, four, to round about 1480. We like to think that Freemasonry began in ancient Egypt, if not before, with the builders and decorators of the pyramids. It's a long story. Um, and a complicated story. The Grand Lodge of England was founded in 1717 in London. There may be as many creation myths as there are Masonic lodges. Some branches claim a Scottish origin. Others honor a link to ancient Egypt. There is no Masonic Pope with global authority, no Grand Imam. No archbishop to issue decrees and edicts. Freemasonry as such doesn't have a dogma, so it doesn't tell its members what things mean. And that's strange, isn't it, when you think about it? That's a bit weird, that here you have an organisation, but it doesn't tell its members what to think about the organisation. And that's what's unique about Freemasonry. But there is Hiram Abiff a minor biblical figure mentioned in a single line of the Book of Chronicles transformed into the central character of Masonic legend and ritual. It's purely Masonic myth and it's a Masonic myth that we can trace back quite a long way. So he's a personification of a belief system. The mythical architect suffers a painful death a killing that remains the nucleus of the most important of all Masonic rituals and a popular term for intense interrogation, the third degree. Now, word reaches King Solomon that his master Mason has been murdered. Alas, I fear the master's word is lost, for you will remember that it was agreed between yourself, myself and Grand Master Hiram Abiff that the secret word of a master mason would not be given unless we three were present and agreed. One of our number is no more. And Hiram Abiff represents the ego, and the ego has to be slain before it can, the spirit can rise free. So you've got to learn to control your ego, and that's what the third degree is all about. And it's a very dramatic ritual. The hunt is on for the killers. They try to bribe a sea captain to aid their escape, but he refuses. Yes, come aboard. But hold, where is your pass? Pass, the gold is our pass, we know of no oh, other. Oh, don't you know that King Solomon has issued an edict that none shall leave the realm without his pass. You that have no pass, here is your gold. You can all obtain passage on my vessel. It's actually King Solomon. We heard the voices of the three ruffians we rushed in and we captured them and bound them and we bring them before you. Jubilar! Without the sacred knowledge, the killers are doomed to capture and execution. Look up and receive your sentence, which is that you be taken without the walls of the city and severally executed agreeably to the imprecations of your own mouths. Be gone! The old password of a master mason has died with Hiram Abiff but I shall substitute a word which shall be used for the regulation of all Master Mason Lodges until the wisdom of future generations should discover and bring to light the true word. Now King Solomon creates a new word, a word that no Mason at this meeting would pronounce on or off camera. We're about to reveal that secret word. Of all the secrets of Freemasonry, none is as tightly guarded or as seemingly silly to outsiders as a single three-syllable word. The pass key to the third degree. It is easy to find this secret word online or in a reference book, but while we can learn the word, 
its true meaning eludes all but those who are initiated into the Masonic Mysteries. For Freemasons, the issue is not the word itself, it is the moral lesson of having and keeping a secret, and respect for those who have earned their wisdom. That secret word is only, however, a substitute for the true pronunciation and understanding of the Tetragrammaton, or yod heh vav -Hey, or Y-H-V-H, only a substitute. And that word is uh, Mahabon, and which I believe is a corruption of the Hebrew Mahaboneh, which can be translated, what, is this the builder? And Hiram, of course, was a builder. My name is Stephen Sukalis, and I'm not a mason. It's a wonderfully powerful ritual. The basic teaching of Freemasonry is to teach you to know yourself. And when you act out the role of Hiram Abeth, it's the most dramatic way of learning what your, what your, what your deepest fears are. Grandmaster Hiram Abeth, I am glad to have met you thus alone. Your fear of dissolution has to be faced. Then die the fear that you are not going to survive forever. You face your mortality in the third degree, and Hiram Abith is the character who dies for you. The story of Hiram Abith may be set in ancient times, but its lesson is easily transplanted to the modern world. I just thought we'd have a little break with you, that's all, boss. This is not break time. Where's the money? I think you better get back to work. The lesson oh, is the same. Seek not what you have not earned. What we have today, unfortunately, is a situation where people now, especially non-Masons, look at what uh, Freemasons do in these dramas, in these plays, um, and believe them to be literally true. And of course, they are not. And this is where they fall into a really quite serious error, because trying to prove something that was never, ever designed to be true is impossible. But not everyone accepts the Masons' claim that the third degree ritual is merely symbolic. The internet has provided a perfect platform for skeptical webmasters like Kevin McNeil Smith. He runs the site called Freemasonry Watch. According to Masonic ritual, if you break your oaths, you, you will be murdered. That is, that is the basic of the oath. Now, Masons will say, well, it's a joke. We don't murder people anymore. Well, the punishments become more bizarre from having your throat slit to having your, your, your chest open perpendicularly and your, your, your lights thrown over your shoulder and buried in the sands. And In fact, the Masonic oath guarantees a gruesome death for those who reveal the secrets. I do promise and swear under no less penalty than to have my breast torn open, my heart and vitals taken from thence and exposed to rot on the dunghill. My name is Jeff, Jeff Russell. I am current master of the lodge of uh, Potomac Lodge number five. Rightly or wrongly, truth or, you know, people like that, ooh, that secret. People ask me, you know, what are the secrets of Freemasonry? That's what I tell them. We know who killed JFK. We know what happened at Area 51. They won't do it right away, and they'll do it in such a way that you, you won't be able to go to the police and say, the Masons are trying to get me, because you'll never be able to prove it. They'll just pick apart your life as they're able to over a period of time. And um, so I would suggest you don't do that. Um, they, the phrase they use for people trying to impersonate themselves as a mason is raining and snowing and um, they get very upset. If you go around making Masonic signs and trying to pass yourself off as a mason, you will, you will get their wrath very quickly. So don't do it. Freemasons say that non-members can never grasp the true meaning of the ceremonies. which is just how the men at the Goose and Gridiron intended it. A lot's been talked about the, the secrets. So you probably heard about the funny handshakes. You know, well, 
when you attain each level in Freemasonry, you're given certain secrets which are relevant to that level. It actually shows which, what level you've attained in Freemasonry. We're a private organization. We're not, we're not a secret organization at all. Um, but there are certain elements of what we do that we, we don't really want everybody to know about because it'll spoil the shared experience that we all go through. In England, they respond with a vivid public ceremony. They're attending a regular... Parading their regalia and their rituals, trying to prove that they are not rooted in evil and thirsty for power. Their patron and figurehead is His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent, Grand Master of the Order. If occasionally, say once in 25 years or so, people can see that our normal business is as we describe it, they may be persuaded to shed whatever unreasonable worries they still have about what in truth is only an inclination to privacy. Society, particularly modern society, needs to have a bogeyman. And if we live in a society as we do now where conspiracy theory is rampant, where people don't want to take responsibility for their own actions, then we become a natural um, whipping boy. The secret is an essential component of a conspiracy theory, and masonry feeds that. I would say this is a little bit of a non-issue, really. Who cares how we shake hands to identify ourselves? The fact is that they are a secret society because they do hold secrets and they do hold meetings in secrets. And the, also the fact is that the higher up the levels you get, the more secrets there are. And that's a very, very clever way of manipulating people's minds. Does anybody ever really know what the secret is? And is there a the secret to it at the end of the day? Who knows? Secrets are a burden to preserve at the risk of death. But they also are a reward, a revelation passed down from those who have gone before. So the debate continues. Amen. It's odd, but I mean, it, I think it's odd to people outside Freemasonry. It's not odd at all to people who are Freemasons. They find it, uh, in many ways, a very interesting exercise, an intellectual exercise, to um, listen to other people's opinion about Freemasonry um, and quite often disagree, but accept the other person's view. Freemasonry is extremely tolerant. So when you get people speculating about whether the ancient Egyptians started Freemasonry or whether it had anything to do with the, with the fabled island of Atlantis or any of that kind of stuff, well, I have no problem with people believing that. There are dangers that people in power need to be very sensitive to. And the ultimate danger is that when one isn't transparent, it will get misinterpreted. As we penetrate the marble walls of Freemasonry, we uncover secrets tightly held for 300 years and more. But the ultimate secret can never be exposed because it lives within the hearts of the Masons themselves. It makes you grow. Grow in uh, responsibility and uh, your faith in your fellow man and helping one another. You take a good man and make him better. And uh, that's what it's all about. The changes that are brought about in you as a human being through the process of initiation, those can't be undone. They're permanent improvements in you that enable you to see the world in a more clear way and to relate to other people in a better way. These are important values that need to be preserved. The quest of Freemasonry is for knowledge not specific information, facts and figures, names and dates, but knowledge itself. Knowledge is what Hiram Abiff refused to reveal to the unworthy. It is what the Knights Templar sought in the Holy Land. It is encrypted in the walls and columns at Rosalyn. And it is what the men who met at the Goose and Gridiron in 1717 developed their rites and rituals to seek. That quest continues, 
a ritual path to knowing and improving oneself. Its deepest secrets never can be fully revealed because they are symbolic and interpreted differently by each individual mason. As we penetrate the marble walls of Freemasonry, we uncover secrets tightly held for 300 years and more. An eerie realm of blindfolded novices and bearded sages, hidden behind curtains of suspicion and clouds of doubt. Words that cannot be spoken, deeds that cannot be witnessed, symbols that cannot be described. It's about putting yourself on an initiatic path toward a greater understanding of the real you and how you relate to the universe. Certainly the desire to want to understand more about universal law and better human relationships here on the planet and a closer relationship with God. These are issues that transcend gender and sex completely. The changes that happen inside you when you have been initiated into a Masonic Lodge, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're in my order or mainstream masonry or some other order, those changes cannot be undone. Within the walls of Freemasonry, millions of brothers and sisters act out rituals that may seem absurd to outsiders. Yet to Masons, these secret handshakes and passwords and stage plays are keys to a hidden realm, the realm of self-awareness that few of us ever attain. Brethren, let us pray. In the initiation ceremony for the third degree, there is a scene in which the murdered body of Hiram Abif is reawakened by the hand clasp of King Solomon himself. It is a tribute to the power of the Brotherhood and the value of knowledge more powerful than death. Where was this lesson forged? At a London pub, a Scottish chapel, or in the mystic stones of the Holy Land? The answer is that all of these hold the key to the secrets of Freemasonry, an enduring order with myths in its history and legends in its soul.